Hi, um, my name is Saar Raz. Um, I'm going to talk about concepts in Clang. I'll explain both parts of this sentence uh, soon. And this is the story of how to write your first compiler feature. Um, let's start about concepts. Well, um, Jason mentioned them in his keynote yesterday, but I'll go over um, some sort of a quick overview of all the um, things that were added in C++ 20. Uh, there are a couple ways to describe concepts, make C++ typed again, like remove duct typing from C++, a type system for types, Python 3 of C++, uh, 20 years in the making. Um, it's, a, it's a big feature and long expected feature. Um, and if, if you just look at the things that were added, we can like summarize them into a few uh, points. First of them is the requires clause. Uh, if before you had something like this, a sort function uh, that takes like a template um, parameter it, which is like an iterator, begin and end. Basically, you can call the sort function with two ints or two strings or anything, basically, because uh, you just get any type to, um, uh, you can give any type to this type name it, and it will work, but it won't work once you uh, try to actually do things with begin and end that don't work if begin and end are not actual iterators. And you get this very cryptic uh, error message um, that something in the internal implementation of sorts didn't work out when you tried to use begin like this or end like that. Um, then after, with the requires clause, you could have something like this. You can add requires iterator it, and uh, basically a call to this function with something that is not an iterator will, not, will no, no longer work. The call itself will not work. Um, another thing you can have is abbreviated templates. If before you had like this foo that takes two uh, template parameters, t and u, uh, and you had to declare it as a template with the type name t, type name u, t, e, t, u, u, a lot of t's and a lot of u's. Now you can have just auto. Now, having auto as a parameter indicates that the whole thing is actually a template. The two things over there are equivalent, um, which is nice. It, it's, a, like, uh, it's more similar to how you'd have it in lambdas if you want to make them generic. Um, Static requirements, you can define um, sort of, you can define um, the thing, the concept, uh, which given a type uh, says whether or not it satisfies some sort of a requirement at compile time, okay? So for example, I can define the large concept, which are types bigger than 10, because like they're pre pretty large if they're bigger than 10 bytes. Uh, I can have more complex requirements, for example, this, Fullable width requirements given a type T and a type U. Um, a type T is fullable with U if uh, T has a foo type inside of it. And you can write uh, T.U, T.foo with U, and, um, uh, and it gives out, the, if, you, if you write out this expression, it returns the, this said foo type, and you can do T. Just Sort of, uh, you can actually name expressions that should be valid and types that should exist. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty elaborate, actually. Um, then, if I run a constraint, um, the call, for, for example, have a do foo function that takes an auto t, I can just write the name of a concept with like optional arguments. For example, this t must be foolable with int in order for do foo to be called with it. So I can do t.foo3 and be certain that it's going to work, because t is foolable with 3. And we have that requirement over there that che checks that this works. Um, one of the like, killer features of, of concepts is nicer error messages. For example, if before you tried to do something like this uh, with a, which you defined yourself, you would get something like this, okay, which is pretty indicative. Um, and now with concepts, you can have something like this, um, saying A is not hashable. Um, and it states exactly what's wrong. Um, uh, the std hash, you didn't implement std hash for A. Um, so this is quite shorter, quite a bit shorter. Um, 
and um, like one of the um, uh, big uh, drivers of the concept switcher was improving those error messages. But not, that's not like everything it does. You also have like overloading. For example, if you have a sort function that would take an iterator, um, begin and end, and uh, for example, you, have, you want a different implementation for sort uh, that would sort differently giving a random access iterator pair, okay? For example, you would sort an array differently than what you would sort a list. Um, so, so now you can have just basically two functions with different constraints and they are valid overloads, meaning if you call sort with a, a pair of iterators into a vector, which is random access, the, the second one will be called because it is more specific and the first one will be called for things that are not random access. Um, okay. So that, this is like the quick, very quick overview of the feature, feature itself. Um, any questions? I'm not going to go very much into detail, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question was um, selecting overload resolution in this case is much more complicated. Um, the way it is uh, performed is like a, an approximation. If, for example, random access iterator is defined as the thing should be an iterator and more things. So, that, so the concepts mechanism just recognizes this and says random access iterator is iterator plus more things, therefore it is, it is more specific. Yeah, if it couldn't uh, uh, um, like, um, understand that something, one thing is more specific than another, it would just say you have an ambiguous call here. Okay, any more questions? Can you come again? It depends on the type you give it. Uh, no, but like if, if, the, if you call this second one with something that is not a random access iterator, it just won't work internally, so it's... Uh, Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, okay, so about me. Um, again, my name is Saar, um, 24 years old from Kiridada, which is like a city near Haifa. Uh, even some of the Israelis don't make the like distinction between Haifa and Kiridada. Uh, it's somewhere up in the north. Um, like programming, graphic design, video games, like Dark Souls, um, nice, here's some woos. Uh, fell in love with C++ ever since I relearned it in like uh, 2015. <coughs> um, and uh, the relevant point is that I have been working on the Clang implementation of this feature, concepts, in uh, the past year or so. And basically this talk is the story of how I got around to doing this. Um, uh, I'm, I won't be fo focusing so much on the feature itself as on the um, series of events that got me around to implementing uh, concepts and a little bit about the implementation and how it went down. Um, okay. So the, the, the short answer is it was a slippery slope. Um, it started with me trying to write a game engine, um, which, which is nice, like a learning thing. Uh, which involved a lot of generics, as any large C++ code base does. Uh, and things were getting out of hand. Um, and writing a lot of generic code without concepts is tedious. Um, you start uh, doing some uh, enable lifts, and, um, and uh, the code becomes less readable, to say the least. And uh, concepts had an implementation in GCC 7 back in the day. It was uh, mid-2017, or beginning of 2017. GC7 wasn't even out back then. It was like a pre-release uh, thing. And the concepts implementation was probably still very buggy by that point. Not sure if it was even maintained. 
Ah, no, it will be fine. I'll just went, for, went with it. So I built GCC 7 and started writing a lot, a lot of con code with uh, concepts, like it was a future. It was amazing. So if before I had this code, uh, this like pass message function, which takes like I don't know how many uh, t type name uh, parameters, and for example, you have no idea what this like propagate um, uh, thing is or what it should be, what what things should accept. Um, it's basically like writing this code, which it isn't, which is like shorter but not really any better in a way of explaining what this actually means. Now you can have um, this. You can just write um, concepts in front of everything, and it's like writing a regular function which takes um, types. It's so just like uh, as if C++ really had a type system. It's amazing. Uh, so after writing this, there's like no turning back, really. It's, 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 well, once you start writing uh, code with concepts, it's like a, really a different like, experience. So, so I wrote a lot, bunch of code with concepts, and uh, they lived happily ever after until uh, it turns out GCC concepts did have some bugs. But we can report them, right? That, that's what the compiler tells you to do uh, once you uh, encounter a bug. So I reported this bug on GCC's bug tracker, and you can notice the date of this bug. Uh, and that, that was the last time I've, I heard about this. Um, so yeah. Um, also, compile times were getting a little bit out of hand. Um, this, involved, this code involved a lot of templates. Basically, it was all in one compilation unit uh, with everything else being generated as templates. Um, uh, also, error messages were starting to get out of hand. I, have this, I had this one time where I had this very unindicative error message uh, pop up. At one point, I tried to compile the project, which seems like a legitimate enough thing to want to do, uh, except it froze, okay? The whole PC froze. Like, the kernel froze. The mouse wouldn't even move at, this point, at that point, okay? So I said, maybe it's like a very long error message. I wasn't sure what was going on, so I tried to um, like do f max errors equals one, which limits the number of errors being output to one. When the, the compiler doesn't try to continue uh, compiling and output more error messages once it encounters the first one. And it still doesn't work, still freezes. Um, I tried to output the message to a file, still doesn't work. Uh, I thought maybe it was a problem with Sig Sigwin, which is like a Linux environment for Windows, which I used back then. Um, so I thought maybe it's the Windows problem. So I moved to a Linux VM. And it freezes. The host as well uh, froze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in high tech, it was a BIOS problem. So <laughs> the host doesn't freeze uh, from such things. And um, anyway, uh, I did output the message to a file inside the VM. And that, that, that didn't freeze. It took like an hour or something, but it didn't freeze. And I had a file with, an, with the error message. Which is good, right? We can read it now. 1.2 gigabytes <laughs> was the size of that file. With fmax errors equals one. Um, what do these 1.2 gigabytes say? You might ask yourself. Um, yeah. How do you even read 1.2 gigabytes of error message? Uh, well, some of the text editors do open this, like Sublime Text does open this. And it turns out this was only 10 lines of error message code. Um, each line was about 100 megabytes, if you uh, do the calculation, uh, and it looked something like this. Look familiar to any of you? Uh, it was basically uh, a template backtrace. It was saying that when I tried to compile foo, with these templates, with this, this 100 megabytes of template argument, uh, you call this function with this uh, 100 megabytes of template arguments, and uh, ev somewhere down the line, it got an error. Uh, so yeah. You can limit this backtrace, uh, but you do need a lot of information from in between to understand what went wrong, like which types went, wound up in the wrong place. Um, 
yeah, people complain that C++ gives an indicative error message that I couldn't even read my error message. So, yeah. So I, start, I decided to go out and parse, because that's what you do with a lot of data. Um, how do you parse 1.2 gigabytes? I started writing a Python script, um, uh, which basically would take this uh, huge error message and take each line of template instantiation. Uh, wait. Sorry. Okay. We take this each line of template instantiation and basically collapse the uh, elaboration on what is T and what is U into like this one and two over here. And then below you can like write one to expand one like lazily, just one level of one and, um, and click two to expand two. And there you can like lazily observe the data over there. Um, this doesn't work. Why? Excuse me? I, I can't hear it. No, I, 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 no, that's not the reason. Yeah, Python is too slow, basically. <laughs> so I moved to C++, of course. So I have a C++ script to parse uh, C++ error messages. And this worked. Uh, I had to really optimize the C++ code, but it ended up working. And I got the bug. Um, and a few days later, the PC freezes again. Uh, this time, two gigabytes of error message. So this was, this was, this, the script couldn't handle this anymore, fortunately. So what do we do now? Um, well, the, actually, the, all this huge description of template arguments was actually compile time trees. It looks something like this. Uh, it was like a tree um, with, with an A as root, and the child was another tree, which has C as root. And it's like a description of a very long type, which is like a, basically a compile time tree of some sort. So it's the name, this name just repeated itself many, 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 many times in the error message. Um, and it was very, very long. How can we shorten this name? Any ideas? What? No, I, I, I want the compiler to not output such a long name for this. No, Lambda, how would you, how would you do it? <laughs> okay. It's still, it's still very long, even if you rename it to one letter. Aliases, the, the compiler looks through aliases in your message. Okay, I couldn't understand what. Yeah, then the compiler would look through that and give you the original name yeah, in the error message. The the no, so, so the compiler doesn't care about aliases, actually. So... <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's still not short enough. So the trick is to create a class or a struct named MyTree that inherits from this huge template name and inherits the constructors. What you get is the type that behaves exactly the same, except it has a shorter, na shorter name in error messages, basically. Um, so this works. And you get just 400 megabytes of error message, <laughs> which is like the script handle this, handles this without any problem. Um, Okay, uh, what now? This is kind of an annoying trick. You have to just take every, every large template you have and, and inherit from it. It's, it's not a long-term solution. So, and I, sometimes I don't really need all this information. I just want to know what, what are the functions that were being called. Maybe I can figure out something from this, but I can't even print the whole list of functions because that's like two gigabytes. So, I took a look at the error message itself. 
Uh, and you can notice this keyword here. It's not a keyword. It's like an interesting word over here, with, with right? Can you see it? It's interesting. It ha even have, has an emoji near it. Um, so I recognize that this width is causing me a lot of problems, basically. And I opened up um, GCC's binary over here and found the width uh, string over here. So this is basically the assembly code that prints out all of this two gigabytes of error message. And I just uh, patched it to not print anything and return from the function immediately. And, um, and that, that was basically it. Once I did that, um, the GCC would just exit immediately and just print the list of functions. It wouldn't like describe all the function, uh, all the template arguments, but um, this worked pretty well. Uh, questions? Okay, so this was the end of that, that unindicative error messages, though I, I had some more unindicative error messages, for example, this one, uh, which many of you maybe uh, got previously. Uh, also have like accusations of murder, um, like this. It was very, it's, it was a tough time, basically. So then I had the thought, if I'm already patching GCC, um, I needed to debug a lot of compile time stuff. I had a lot of, like most of my work was during compile time actually. Um, and there is no print debugging during compile time, which is like, like as programmers, it's like our most basic of tools, print debugging. And I wanted to add some print debugging during compile time. So I opened up GCC sources, my greatest mistake. Um, well, no, the yeah, good thing, GCC's source code is, is very nice. For example, this is parser.c, which parses all of C++. Um, and as you can see, the number of lines of code in this file is, is pretty nice, 40,000. And this is not even the largest file there is. There's uh, 52,000 lines of codes in another file. Um, so yeah, um, the plan was to add a new keyword to C++ called static print. I um, wanted to do something like this, where you can just shove a static print somewhere in your code, gives it, give it like string literals and things that can be printed, uh, like compile time things, basically, for example, types, for example, content, constant expressions, template names, anything. And when you compile this code, you would have uh, the compiler print this. For example, here, y's type is test of int and three. Okay, pretty simple thing. Um, how do you add a keyword? That's not, it's not like a documented thing. That, it's not a very regular thing to do. Well, I did take compiler's class back in university, and from there I can assume that maybe there's probably like a nice little file that defines all the grammar of C++ and I could just add my, declaratively add my uh, new keyword there, and everything would work just fine, right? Yeah. Uh, so the real world isn't as pretty, uh, or shall I say C++ isn't as pretty, because it just functions all the way down, basically. Um, no declarative uh, little nice little file. So what do we do now? Any ideas? Hmm? Mm, OK. Not yet. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, so, so my, my basic strategy was copy, paste. Okay? Copy and paste. Um, static print behaves awfully similar to static assert, basically. Okay? For example, I'll, I'll just walk you through a few key points. It can appear in the same places, which is basically like anywhere, I guess. Uh, it also parses string literals, okay? You can give static assert an error message to print out um, when, it, when its constant expression doesn't work. And it also starts with static underscore and is colored pink in the slides, which is also very, very similar. So the plan was the following. Um, I will search the whole source of GCC for the string static assert. I will find where this keyword is being parsed and whatever it is, duplicate it and change it to static print. Okay, that was, that was the plan. 
Uh, if that string is uh, assigned to anything else, I will just do that recursively and um, find do another uh, whole file search for, of the, over the source. So let's start. I found this thing over here. Uh, this C common res words array, um, which has a list of keywords in C, C++. Uh, and one of them is static assert. Seems pretty promising, right? So I just added this, uh, static underscore print. We don't even know what all of this is. I see like RID static assert, duplicate that to RID static print. Uh, and these flags look okay, I guess, so I just co copied them over. Um, but now we have RID static print, right? So let's do that recursively. Find RID static assert. There is like an en enum that uh, uh, lists it, so I add RID static print over there. Then I search for more usages, and I found, find this. If the next token is static assert, we have a static assertion. Seems pretty promising, right? So I just duplicate the entire uh, else if. If the next token is static print, we have a static print statement. Uh, even uh, duplicated the comment to make it more believable. Uh, this um, CP parser static print uh, function is probably where uh, uh, the real deal uh, happens. This is the business logic of parsing a static assert uh, uh, statement. It's not very long. I'll walk you through it. Um, for example, here we can see a comment that says, look for the static assert keyword. So I can assume it looks for the static assert keyword. Uh, and even checks like RID static assert twice. I'm not sure why. Um, it parses string literals, just as we expected. Pretty cool. Uh, it also parses constant expressions, which is nice, but not enough, right? We wanted to parse not only constant expressions, but also like types. We want to be able to give static print a type, so it prints it out. Um, just parsing constant expressions is problematic. Okay? It's not enough. I wanted to accept any compiled time thing, not only, ex not only expressions, basically. Types, template names. How do you parse this monster, basically? It can be anything, right? Any ideas? Compiler, what do you mean? Yeah, but that's a print. It's not a parse. I want to parse this thing. OK, so what other thing in C++ can accept expressions, types, template names? Decal type can accept types. Uh, think that can accept expressions and uh, I think types, not sure. Uh, template names, no. Excuse me? Size of can't accept uh, template names. I heard template parameters. It's kind of the thing. It's template arguments, right? Because you can pass uh, templates accept, can accept either types or template or templates or expressions. So the thing that parses template arguments is probably going to parse either of these three things. And I found CP parser template argument, which seems pretty promising, right? So I basically used it to parse uh, the arguments that are not string literals in static print, and it worked. Uh, I compiled the first working program using static print, and I got the print message uh, at uh, compile time. But then I found a bug. This, the following code doesn't work. Why? Excuse me? By the way, size of t equals 3 works. That's it. OK, so if you remember, if you remember, I am using parse template argument to parse this argument over here. And once it, it says, OK, you have a size of t, and then it encounters this greater than symbol and says, OK, that's the end of the template argument list and returns. So yeah. 
Um, yeah, basically the lesson le learned here is when you copy paste, you may break some hidden code assumptions in the code uh, you're using. So just make sure to scan the code, you at least scan it for sort of assumptions like this. Um, how the, the way I solved it was passing another argument to CP parse or template, CP parse template argument, which is like is static print, and then it looks for closing uh, uh, parentheses instead. Very hacky. Okay, but now it really works. Um, I can print debug my own code at compile time, and I said maybe others would like to use this, use this thing as well. I had four options as I saw it back then. This one, option number one, just use it for myself, which is no work, which is always good. Uh, two, publish the .patch file, which is like a day's work, maybe. Three, try getting this merge into GCC, which is like a month's work, might not be accepted, it's not part of the standard, it's very, I'm not sure. Four, propose this to the standard, which is like two years. And there were already like some proposal in circulation that does something similar. So I went with number two, which just seems like a reasonable compromise back, at, back then. I uh, published this on Reddit, and um, which got a lot of likes, as you can see. But some people were not very pleased uh, with this. For example, this person. Yeah, so, so apparently I was cheating because you can't extend the language. This is cheating. Um, also, Jason here uh, featured me on his uh, uh, C++ Weekly. Um, so thanks, Jason. Uh, it was pretty cool. But then, then I, I published this on uh, GitHub. Um, and th this just had the patch file, so people would like uh, clone GCC7, apply the patch, and they would have static print, basically. Um, but there, is a, there was a problem. What's the pro can you see the problem? Excuse me? That's, it, that's right. But, but that, that wasn't the problem here. Well, the problem is this, right? There's an issue. What is that, that issue? Well, someone reported a bug saying, um, on Mac, uh, blah, 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 the compilation fails during stage two with the following error. What is stage two? So, quick word about bootstrapping. It's basically a concept in compilers where you have a new version, for example, of GCC, comes out with new optimizations, right? If you compile it, you get a compiler that builds faster code because it has this new optimization thing. But the compiler itself was compiled with a worse compiler, right? Which didn't have the set optimizations because, because they are new. So if you compile it again, you get a fast compiler that builds fast code. This is stage two, okay? But maybe the optimizations broke behavior, okay? So a good way to test this is compile again and expect to get the same result, okay? This is stage three. Um, TLDR, compilers, 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 compiler, compile, compile, compilers. Um, so what was the issue? How can compilation fail in stage one but succeed in stage, like succeed in stage one and fail in stage two? How is this possible? Any ideas? I compiled before I did my patch, so it probably I caused a problem. Mm -hmm. Where, but, but like the GCC's code doesn't use static print, right? But it's, it's, it's close. Uh, the problem was we added a new keyword, right? Static print. In stage one, we used the compiler without this keyword. And I had a local variable named static underscore print. So in stage two, static print becomes a keyword, and using this as a variable name is a syntax error, basically. So I renamed the variable, and it, it all worked, basically. Uh, okay. 
Excuse me? Yeah. I, no, I, I, because I turned off stage two and three because it was like took years to compile. <coughs> um, okay, so given static print, I could also do like a poor man's profiler on my long compilation times, like do a static print before big template, func that instantiates huge template, then after big template and see what takes all the compilation time. Like Clang has a, had like a template profiler thing, but I was using DCC because only it had concepts. Um, but it was still, still very, very, very slow to compile. And GCC had a page on their website saying that they know the compiler is slow and they need to take care of that. Um, also, some say Clang is faster. So I, have four, I had four options at that point as I saw them at that time. First one is drop the project, which is no work, which is always good. Um, number two, stop using concepts which is like a week's work and a lifetime of regret. <laughs> Three, optimize GCC, no. <laughs> and four, implement concepts in Clang myself, <clears throat> which is like a month or two, I guess. Um, I went with the last one. Don't let, th this is my line of reasoning. That, that was my line of reasoning back then. Don't ask me uh, what, what, what was I thinking. <laughs> Um, so yeah, concepts and Clang. Uh, I thought someone's probably done it already, right? It's like this huge feature, 20 years in making, it's impossible that someone hasn't done it already. So let me Google that for you. I got this result, concept Clang, an implementation of C++ concepts in Clang. It sounds pretty good, right? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> well, you see a problem over here? <clears throat> yeah, 2011. Okay, it's pretty weird, right? Concepts were merged in 2018, I think, or, or no, 2017. <clears throat> and the syntax looks pretty weird. It's like the template parameter list is after the concept name. It's pretty weird, actually. Um, then I found this article uh, by Bjarne. Um, saying that in, from 2009, and uh, this, this is basically a letter um, mourning the, the remove, removal of concepts from the standard after it, it, they have already been merged, had already been merged uh, before. He's saying, he's explaining why this happened in three pages uh, and why, why it's terrible and why, uh, but, but the, the point is concepts were already in the start, standard at C++ 11, but then were ripped out because they were not ready. Um, and I've also found this um, on uh, Clang's uh, webpage of support. Um, they say that this is, uh, it's not work in progress, it's said that it's superseded by this P something. I also found this mailing list uh, thing. Um, where this person is asking whether or not, that, uh, is saying that this is a work in progress, but it's listed as a work in progress, but it, do, it doesn't know like how far along is it. And uh, it got an answer by uh, uh, Hubert, Hubert Tong, which uh, worked on the feature before, on Clang, apparently, and he says, okay, yeah, concept CS is on trunk. Um, the implementation is occurring on trunk. If you want like the latest version, you should uh, check out uh, the trunk and just use it. So I checked out trunk, and it, it, it turned out the, it even had a F concepts TS flag. So, but it seemed it's just like parsed some like requires clauses and ignored them completely at that point. Anyway, um, seems like no substantial work had already been done at the time. So yeah, um, that was when I. Uh, uh, had a bit of thinking to do because I was not a compiler engineer and why in the hell would the clan gods even let me work on their compiler, right? It's like very, why would this even work? So I had the following plan. Implement the whole feature without asking anyone. That's the first uh, stage. Then just show up at Clang's door with everything implemented and then they'll accept me. Um, 
that was that was that was a, what was I was thinking back then. Uh, this like approach worked in some places, uh, so I thought maybe not. Why not here? And I started um, working on that. Um, back then, I said, how hard could it be? Just a bunch of error messages, right? Um, how do you implement a C++ feature? Where do you even start, right? Um, well, I found this thing, P0734R0. Well, changes to the standard are basically diffs to the standard text. So, for example, you have this uh, change to um, this clause that lists the list of entities, and you basically add a, com a concept comma over here, and here they remove the or and add, uh, add a comma or a concept, it's a very like technical diff to the standard text. And this diff was 36 pages long, uh, which is like compared to the standards 1,400 pages is very, not very long, but still, just to give you a little perspective, it's considered a pretty big feature. Well, here goes nothing. We'll start slowly and we'll just add the notion of a concept declaration. Um, this is the part that describes how concepts are made. You see here, concept definition, um, the keyword concept, a concept name, which is an, an identifier, equals constraint expression. Seems easy enough, right? Just like parse concept, parse a name, parse an equals, parse a constraint expression. Um, well, how do I add a concept? Well, I use the only tool in my arsenal right now, which is copy and paste. That's right. So I searched the entire sources for a file named template something. And I found templatedecl.h. Seems promising enough, right? And contains a class named temp template decl. Seems like very good, nice, and a bunch of things that inherit from it and from redeclarable template decl, which I assumed meant like, if, if you're a redeclarable template, for example, a function, you can like declare it once, then define it again in a separate place, then you inherit from redeclarable, otherwise you inherit from, from template decal. Uh, so I, I said concepts syntax do not allow for just a declaration of concept, and they, you have to define it right there and then, so I probably should just inherit from template decal. Um, so let's inherit from template decal. And this was the code. As you can see, I had a comment here. Um, uh, I have like a concept decal, which inherits from template decal. I have this constraint expression, a pointer to ex an expression. I have all these parameters, which I don't know what, what the, like, the meaning of is, but the like, template decal accepts them, so I just forward them into it. They have this create and create deserialize, which all the classes around seem to have, so I added them as well. Uh, I had some getters and setters, just to be nice. And all this thing here, which I'm not sure what was the purpose of, but everyone else around had them as well, so I added it as well. Um, what now? Um, yeah, so I, I need to pick something roughly similar to a concept and search everything from it, and this way I'm going to add it to the uh, compiler. Ideas? Something that's very similar to a concept. Excuse me? Okay. Using is a good idea. Sphene is not, I'm looking for the concept declaration itself. Okay, so I went with a variable template declaration. For example, this, instead of large, I can just use context per bool large equals something. Um, seems like a similar syntax. So I just searched the uh, code base for var template decal. As you can see, there are over 100 matches in more than 10 files. So yeah. Um, I do this for a while. I had to go through, go through all manner of weird stuff. For example, AST dumper, AST reader, AST writer, all these mentions of var template in non-code non files. For example, this file, decalnodes.td, which like has var template over here. This is, I'm not sure what the syntax here even is, but I added a concept here as well. Uh, <laughs> and made it look very uh, unsuspicious. Uh, and a bunch of switch cases that handle all sorts of things. I had added concepts there as well, and it compiles, which is like a miracle. But where do we parse this thing? 
following var template decal around was kind of annoying because it's like it has to parse the type and it's very complicated. So I just followed the template keyword itself. I, f I searched the code base for a template and I found this error message over here, which is said, which says uh, you need uh, 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 angle bracket to start a template parameter list and the function is parse template parameters, which is nice. It's very close to the concept keyword in the, in the syntax, right? The function that calls this is, um, has this actual check for the template keyword over, over here, right? And then parse this as the template parameters. So, down the line in this function, I find, I find this, parse single declaration after template. Seems very, very promising. So I'm just gonna leave this here. Um, if the keyword, if the current token is a concept, parse concept definition. And now I have parse concept definition. Um, I just mix and match a few things from all around. I assume I consume the token because that's how you do it, apparently. I parse a, a keyword, a, an identifier like you do here. I uh, check for the equal. I parse an expression for the constraint expression, right? Uh, and I expect and consume semi for a semicolon. And then I act on concept definition because every, all the parse uh, functions act on something in the, in the end. Um, so it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, and this works. Um, the concept is parsed. Um, but there was a bug. The following code had compiled. What's the problem? What's B, right? This compiles. Um, yeah. Spot the bug. Pretty easy, as you guys should see. Well, of course, it's I used to parse the constraint expression. I used parse expression, and not actions dot correct delayed typos in expert on the parse expression. Of course, um, I have no idea how you guys missed that. Um, so yeah, the, the problem was typos. Uh, it turns out when you use a parse expression, it might return, encounter like a non-existent identifier, in which case, Clang would treat it as a typo and try to find something similar that you probably meant to, to use. For example here, A. So it recognized the typo and returned the expression A. And I should have known to call correct delay typos on expert, which would, out, which would output the error message saying you had a typo. But this wasn't documented on parse expression, for example. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there are a lot of unwritten rules like this in the compiler code base. Um, the things that, that, that you should probably, uh, I, you probably have no way to know until you don't, if you don't use them and debug the uh, consequences. And for example, you have all, the, all manner of stack objects which you have to uh, initiate, all these layering uh, things. For example, for a concept, I needed parse concept, act on concept de de declaration, create concept, like, like a static create function inside a class and the constructor of a concept. Um, this is a good argument for the copy and paste strategy, right? Because you just find a similar place in code that does something similar to what you want to do, and then you can see all the uh, unwritten rules in action, basically. You see what is done in cases where you encounter something, um, and then you can really do, see how things are done around in the code base. It's a very good way to learn um, how things are done properly. Um, yeah. Type example is also a common like example of general mindset you have to have when uh, you're working on a compiler that you don't have quit outs. If you encounter an error, if the user made a mistake, you fire an error message, and, but then you guess what he actually meant and continue parsing as if that what he actually did. <coughs> um, you have to defend the user. For example, you have this syntax here, which is like the trailing return, return uh, uh, type syntax where you write auto in the beginning, and then dash, you write the uh, return type in the end. Okay, that's, this is a syntax that's been around since C++ 11. 
which of the following is correct? If I want to add a requires clause, do I add it before the error or after the error? The arrow. Which one of these is correct if I want to add or requires large t? Before the trailing return type or after it? Before. <laughs> well, actually, the second one is the correct one. Uh, but users are still going to get confused, right? No one's going to know. Like, I, I'm, I'm still I have to like run this in my head a bit to. to figure this out. In practice, I try to parse both ways and accept both forms and just output an error message if you pick the wrong one, explaining that you should put it, the thing uh, after. Um, yeah, the code behaves the same both ways. Though. So the compiler need, needs to defend the users from the harsh standard, which has all these rules, which users are not going to know about because no, most users don't read the standard. Um, you need to expect the unexpected, basically. Also. Every word used in the standard is there for a reason. And cutting corners almost, like, mostly ends in death. Uh, for example, you had this thing. For example, say, say that you have a foo um, with uh, two versions. Okay, the first one requires the size of t is more than one. The second one requires the size of t is more than one. And size of t is greater or equal to four. Then you call it with an int. Which one of the, the two would you expect to be called? The second one, right? This is actually ambiguous. Why? Well, if we observe the standard, it says um, for two atomic constraint, atomic constraint is like, for example, here, size of t greater than one is an atomic constraint. This one here is an atomic constraint as well. Two atomic constraints are identical if they are formed from the same expression and the targets, ta ta ta, that doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, th this, these two are the same expression, right? Seems like are, they, this should work because they are the same expression. Well, they are the same, they should be the same expression, not the same expression. As you can see, expression italics is used here in the standard, right? And when, when expression italics is used, it means the grammar rule expression should be, uh, it should be actually uh, come out from the same grammar, the same place in the source, basically. So the, the use of italics here uh, indicates something different. So even the formatting of the standard is not to be ignored. Uh, yeah. Uh. Users are not going to know about this. Uh, I've had, like, I think three bug reports saying, why doesn't, why doesn't this work? And I'm, I had to explain the thing many, many times over. So I ended up trying both ways. If, if, if I get an ambiguous uh, call, I try to parse it as if this rule, uh, as if this wasn't in italics. And if I see that this works without, without uh, italics, then I explain the problem to the user. Um, well, yeah. Anyway, I continue like copying and pasting my way uh, around the feature. For example, um, the way I found um, uh, the place to check where the constraints are satisfied, I just uh, search for the error messages produced when, uh, for example, you give a wrong number of template arguments uh, to a template. Um, when then I found the function that checks whether template arguments match the template. And there, I added my check for constraints. And I and finished most of the feature in about a month's work. Um, so what now? Well, um, I had most of the thing implemented. And then I found I was about to show up to the client community with my patch. And then I saw this, incremental development. Uh, we have a strong dislike for huge changes or long-term development branches an LLVM. And a friend also warned me that getting stuff merged into LLVM is really hard. Oh, snap. Um, so I had a plan B for all this. Instead of coming up with a patch ready to merge, I would break wh up what I did into like theoretically, and into like commit size steps of what I would theoretically do if I were to implement concepts in Clang and come up with, the, with this roadmap instead, with the plan. Okay? 
So I did that. I split what my patch into, I go, went over the diff and split it up into like logical steps, commit size steps, and um, then the moment of truth, the most stressful email I've ever sent. Uh, I sent this email to the Clang developers community saying we should go ahead and implement concepts now for the following reasons. It's been merged into the standard. Uh, it's really not that hard. It should take about a month or two. Like concepts, in, uh, like uh, it hasn't been implemented from specification. And I have this roadmap. And of course, uh, if you need, I, I'm also willing to help implement this. Um, then I got this because I was not on the mailing list. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then I added myself to the mailing list. Then I got a response from Richard Smith, uh, which is the editor of the standard, also uh, big guy in Clang, saying, um, thank you for the offer to help out. Uh, we are very much open to adding concepts, but the only reason we hadn't done it before is the lack of volunteers such as yourself with the time to devote to the task. And uh, this Hubert, which we saw earlier, said, uh, the only reason for the delay has been an issue with finding people with time to work on it. Basically, great success, right? Um, I was preaching to the choir, basically. Um, they wanted to do concept, but didn't have anyone to do it. Um, <laughs> then, but then, I, uh, Cheng Yu uh, replied, said, I'd like to help you implement your roadmap. I've finished point one, and I'm working on points two and three. If I have any questions, I will uh, ask you. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I didn't tell them that I have the thing implemented already, but anyway. Uh, four months later, uh, um, I realized like small commits are very good. Turns out that implementing and testing the feature correctly takes longer than a month or two, like I said in the email. And after four months, I reached the same point I had before I sent out, out the email, but properly this time. Uh, and a few people on Reddit suggested that I get a version of that up on Compiler Explorer. I sent an email to Matt Goldbolt, and basically he put it up very, very quickly as an experimental thing you can uh, uh, use on Compiler Explorer and check out the compiler right now. Um, since then, a bunch of other people uh, got on the train. <laughs> there are a bunch of experimental uh, uh, Clang compilers right now. Then I wanted to let the whole world know. Uh, send a Reddit post. Um, uh, do you see the bug, though? Do you see it now? I sent this out on April 1st, 2018. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, all I had left were uh, requires expression, which are these uh, uh, pretty simple expressions over here that check static requirements. Uh, seems easy enough. Uh, yeah, it wasn't so easy. Uh, most of the, probably most of the complicated expressions in the language or something but I parsed it and the compiler was now feature complete. I sent an email, a, a, another Reddit post not on April Fools, and that's it, and, and that, was, that went better. Um, since then, I've been fixing bugs reported by the incredible concepts and regions community, um, mostly on C++ Slack, um, and um, then in November, there was this Reddit post which said, we've added another feature to concepts. Uh, so yeah, so I have no more work to do right now. Current status of this is that no new bugs, oh, this one, uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, have been surfaced in a while. After fixing over 50 bugs, this feature has infinite uh, edge cases. Um, I'm working right now to, towards merging this into trunk. I have the first commit approved, but not committed yet. Um, I'm trying to nag Richard, Richard Smith to do the actual commit. And um, I have this uh, stack of commits. Another one was added here. Um, basically, nine commits uh, that implement the feature gradually. So yeah, 
Uh, lessons learned from all this. Um, hacking on compilers is fun, and anyone with the control key can do it. Even people on Macs with the command key. Um, um, you have to be naive at first, uh, learn from your mistakes and from CR. A lot of things that I learned the hard way, I could have, uh, 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 like things, CR, CRs actually pointed me to like manuals I missed when uh, trying to uh, uh, implement the feature in the first place. So I could have avoided many hours of debugging. You have to search really hard for those developer's manuals. Um, everything in standards is there for a reason, never assume otherwise. And also the main takeout is take control of your compiler. It's not, the compiler is not a uh, insurmountable like uh, alien code base. It's just another code base and uh, you can uh, um, contribute and work on it uh, just as well as you can on your current project. Um, and the fastest way to get C++20 is to implement it yourself. Uh, um, that's it, basically. Okay. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> I've yet to I've yet to even know if, if it improves the compile times. And the, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the, I think the bootstrapping thing I learned in compilers class, and that's it. <laughs> and very much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, you get used to it eventually. Um, so it's kind of nice when, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice, when, when you get to know the standards, pretty nice. After concepts, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I found some uh, edge cases that manifest in, in like uh, errors in the standard mostly manifest themselves in like return values you get from certain places, the compilers that you don't know what to do with. And then you try to check the standard and see that it doesn't handle this case. Uh, so, so many, like uh, many edge cases uh, were found. Some of them I found that were already like published, like in the concepts bug tracker uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can come over and give you some cute tips after. That. Yeah. Yeah, just, I won't answer this right now, just uh, come on, take it the whole phone. Okay, thank you. <laughs>